Welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Lidar Gravelazi, and this week, the Islamic Republic of Iran launched an historic and unprecedented attack overnight on Saturday, sending over 300 missiles and suicide drones to strike Israeli targets. This marks the first time Iran launched a direct assault against Israel from its soil. From north to south and in Jerusalem, Israelis were sent running to bomb shelters as Israel's David Sling aero missile systems and aircraft intercepted the threats. Missiles were even intercepted over the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, the third holiest site in Islam. And despite the overwhelming nature of the attack, the IDF was able to successfully neutralize the threats together with an international coalition of allies, including the U.S., U.K., and Jordan. And now all eyes are on Jerusalem as it ponders a response to this major escalation by the Islamic Republic. And as Western allies who stood beside Israel during the attack are now urging restraint and calling on Israel not to respond. Joining us today to discuss the Iranian attack and its aftermath is Arya Lightstone, former advisor to U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman and one of the key architects of the Abram Accords, and Ari Harrow, the former chief of staff to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you both for joining. Thank you, Lida. So Ari, let's start with, you know, this was truly an historic uh, attack, but I actually want to start on a positive note. And there are quite a few positives here. You know, Israel was able to neutralize 99% of the threats. There was minimal damage. We saw incredible collaboration between Israel, the U.S., U.K., France, even Jordan, and some reports say also Saudi Arabia. Would you categorize this as a win for Israel? So I think that... It was definitely a win as far as Israel's defense is concerned. But anyone that is a sports fan, and it doesn't matter what your sport is, it could be soccer, it could be basketball, it could be baseball, it's very, very important to have a good defense, but you cannot win a game without an offense. We have a reality today that has been opened up in a much more broad and much more public sphere, and that is that Iran is at war with Israel. They were at war when the Houthis attacked, they were at war when Hamas attacked, and they were at war when Hezbollah attacked. And for Israel to sustain that type of attack and not respond and not uh, teach them the lesson that needs to be taught, it cannot yet be called a victory. All right, so I do want to get back uh, to the Israeli response in a moment. But Ari, you know, Iran has until now avoided striking Israel directly. It's only done so via its terror proxies. So this begs the question, how did we get here? You know, why does Iran suddenly feel so emboldened as to attack Israel now? Well, Iran has changed its pivot because it's looked at the different chess pieces on the board and has decided that Israel doesn't have its main piece, and its main piece is the uh, undivided, as they say, ironclad support of the United States of America. And that was evidence based upon Chuck Schumer from the hallowed halls of the Senate calling to replace the duly elected prime minister of Israel, from President Biden explaining that uh, the relationship with Israel must change prior to Rafah, and essentially saying that there's a deep division in between the Biden administration and the state of Israel. And once Iran saw that, I think they saw this as a moment to test how divided that relationship truly is. I don't believe that Iran did anything other than a pawn feint, uh, to expand on the chess uh, analogy, to see exactly what the defenses of Israel and its allies would look like. And I think that they discovered a lot more than the rest of the world is letting on. And Ari, do you agree with this assessment? Because, you know, uh as Arya pointed out, you know, the Biden administration's policy on Iran has been, you know, very puzzling, to say the least. You know, he recently released uh, some $10 billion to the Islamic Republic, money that, would, that most likely went towards uh, attacking Israel and funding its terror proxies. I mean, so how do you explain this? I, I most definitely agree with Arya that uh, the, the, any sign of weakness from the West, from the United States, just encourages... Uh, additional attacks and additional movement from our enemies uh, and the axis of evil. I think that as soon as the United States pivoted away from the unbelievable support they showed Israel post-October 7th and 
started um, uh, started putting the pressure not on the Hamas terrorists to release the hostages, not on Hamas to stop uh, putting their own civilians in danger, but rather focus the efforts on Israel, that sent a very broad message to the world. And I think that, unfortunately, for everyone in the West, those are messages that are seen not just in our region, but around the world. The Russians see it, the Chinese see it, and enemies of peace and stability all over the world see it. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And Arya, you know, you've made uh, your feelings about uh, the Biden administration uh, and their handling uh, of, you know, uh, the events uh, since October 7th and even before very clear. But, you know, we still can't deny the fact that uh, the night of the, the attack, the Iranian attack, the Biden administration stood beside Israel, uh, you know, sending in its own planes, uh, you know, leading a coalition of allies. I mean, what do you make of that? So I, I think we have to divide this into a couple different categories. Wendy Sherman, uh, who I think is actually plays a central role throughout this entire process, had a revealing interview just yesterday where she said, it's unfortunate that Iran attacked Israel. Now, had she ended the sentence there, that would have been fine. It's unfortunate that Iran attacked Israel because it distracted from the world ganging up on Israel and pushing Israel to stop its war in Gaza. And now Israel has regained some of the sympathy of the war. Now, this is the same Wendy Sherman who represented the United States of America under President Obama and negotiated the Iran deal that has brought us to this stage. Her uh, assertion, as with President Obama's assertion, is that if we embrace Iran, they will join the community of nations. And President Biden's track since day one of his being in office has enriched and ennobled Iran. And that money and that ability has gone to fund Hamas and the Houthis and Hezbollah and the attack that occurred this past Saturday night. With all of that, the United States' military has been in lockstep with the state of Israel and its allies. And I would give equal credit to Jordan, who protected its sovereignty over its borders also on Saturday night. They did what they were supposed to do, and they should be commended for that. Nonetheless, the reporting that's come out in the last 24 hours is essentially the United States of America pre-negotiated what the attack would be from Iran against Israel. And that in of itself is not only obscene, but it's insane. And Ari, would you agree? I mean, is the Biden administration once again throwing Israel under the bus on the international stage? I think that the United States is the key ally uh, for Israel. I think that the relationship is a relationship um, that has seen its ups and downs. And I think that the people of the United States are extremely supportive of the state of Israel. It is critical that Israel continue to present itself in the true light, which is that we are at the forefront of a war that is being waged against the United States. These same Iranian proxies have attacked American interests in the region. They've killed American soldiers. Um, and when they attack the state of Israel, in essence, they are attacking the United States. Now, with all that said, we are a sovereign country, and we do have our own national interests and our national security interests. And I think that Israel ultimately has to decide what is best for the state of Israel. It has to do what's best for the security of the people of Israel. And hopefully, the United States will come along uh, in supporting Israel when it acts. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and let's talk a little bit about the Israeli response. You know, today we're seeing world leaders calling for Israel to show restraint and essentially tying Israel's hands in any kind of response uh, to the Islamic Republic. I mean, Arya, what do you make of this? And what do you think Israel needs to or should do now? 
Well, the, the failure to call Iran out for what they are is not a this year's problem or a this week's problem. It's going on for 45 years. And certainly since the Iran deal in 2014-2015 has continued to happen, there's been a sense which economically I'd like to do business with Iran because after all they're going to shoot at Israel before they shoot at us. And that's been the European mentality and to a great degree uh, the American mentality as well. So what does Israel have to do now? I think that Israel, if it decides definitively to finish the job in Rafah, if it decides definitively to accomplish the job in Lebanon, let's understand that that is a direct attack against Iran as well. I think Iran has taken the mask fully off. It is a face, but its arms and its legs are very much Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and uh, the Houthis in Yemen. So I think that Israel needs to take one of those pieces fully off the board now and forever. And I think if it accomplishes that, that would be very meaningful. And uh, I think that the West should back that. Mm -hmm. Ari, do you agree with this assessment? And can you know Israel risk international isolation over, say, an operation in Rafiyah to, to eliminate uh, Hamas or one of the pieces, as, uh, as Arya suggested? I think the point Ari made uh, is very, very important. Um, and that is that there are not three or four different uh, fronts uh, taking place sim simultaneously at the moment. There is one enemy, and it's called Iran. They unmask themselves by attacking Israel directly. I think that the ability to coordinate with the international community is important. It's something that Israel should try and do, and we should be as, uh, as open as we can with our allies in discussing our goals. But having said that, I repeat what I said earlier, which is that the security and the safety of the residents of Israel, of the state of Israel, are non-negotiable. And with that in mind, Israel needs to do what it needs to do. There is no reality where Israel does not finish off Hamas in Gaza, whether it's Rafah or the central camps in, the, in, in central Gaza, uh, thereby removing Hamas. We cannot send our residents in the south back home before Hamas has been destroyed. I think that a response to Iran is critical. And I'm talking about on Iranian soil as well. You cannot have a reality where they shoot 300 missiles um, at the state of Israel, including UAVs, obviously. Um, and we just sit back and say, well, we, you know, we stopped them, so therefore we're going to ignore that. That was a clear declaration of war, and it has to be met with a strong hand in order to avoid another round. If we ignore it, we're inviting additional attacks against us. We have to remember that our uh, standing has changed after October 7th. We no longer can be in a mindset that says, let's just defend against these evils. We need to be in a mindset that says, we need to respond and we need to protect against these evils. Uh, and Arya, you know, Ari saying taking uh, the fight directly to Iran, Iranian soil, do you agree with that? Is that what Israel should do? Is that how Israel should respond? Well, our, Ari is articulating, I think, the Israeli position, and I think it's important that Israel has the Israeli position. Where the West is on this, is not where Israel is, and that's the problem with the West. It's not the problem with Israel in this particular case. Uh, the West is, is practicing its very best to be a Neville Chamberlain lookalike. Uh, there's not a lot of Churchillian uh, figures in the West at this point in time. But here's what I would advise Israel if they were interested in hearing the advice. Uh, the fight needs to be brought to Iran in a meaningful way, but not in an immediate way. And I think that if that opportunity exists, there are immediate opportunities that exist in Gaza and in Lebanon. And where those moments exist, I would take advantage of those. And a meaningful opportunity will arise with Iran. And at that moment, it should be seized. I do not believe it needs to be immediate. Uh, Iran uh, put the fear, if you will, of Israel, or well, fear of God into Israelis for the better part of a week. Um, I think it would be very beneficial if several people in Iran were afraid for a period of time that was unknown. And Ari, you know, I do want to circle back for a moment to something that you, a point that you brought up. You know, there are concerns that Israel has essentially just traded Hamas for Iran. I mean, in the sense that from now on, Israel will see future cycles of warfare, uh, not with Hamas in Gaza, as we've seen uh, throughout the years, but with Iran directly. I mean, do you think this is the path we're headed down? 
No, I don't. Um, I think that Iran created this uh, web of proxies for a reason. Um, it will continue to try and use those proxies and keep the war as far away from it as possible while jumping in whenever it feels that it wants to or needs to. We, as Ari alluded to in his comments, uh, we need to deal with the proxies at our doorstep, be it in the south, be it in the north, and be it, you know, a little bit further. There's the militias in Syria, the militias in Iraq, uh, the militias in Yemen. Um, we are now facing an enemy that has created frontal bases on our doorstep, but its bigger bases are back home. And we have to look at it as one continuous uh, enemy and deal with it in such a fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting because let's talk about these proxies. I mean, right now, Israel is facing threats from the north, from the south, you know, uh, from the east. It's surrounded uh, by Iranian proxies. How we got to this point is, is a whole nother uh, topic uh, for a whole nother show. Uh, but, you know, how is Israel able to, uh, to take out one of these proxies? Its hands are being tied both in Gaza, not to mention uh, Hezbollah in the north. Uh, Ari, I mean, what do you what do you have to say about that? Well, I'll say from an American perspective, America loves a winner. And while America was impressed with the defensive display from Saturday night, that's not winning. And what's happened in uh, Gaza up till now is not winning. And what's happening in Lebanon right now is not winning. And it will be very difficult for the United States of America to not back a winner here, especially a winner that shares our values, shares our morality, and shares really our future that we have with it. And I would encourage Israel to win and to win definitively. And I think it needs to define what that is and to go out and to go get that. Let's just be exceptionally clear, though, about what the Middle East looks like. What the Middle East is, you have two competing ideas. You have somebody who receives billions of dollars and spends it on tunnels and drones and SUVs and cruise missiles and nuclear projects. And you have other countries who spend it on AI and health tech and clean tech and energy tech. There are two Middle East here. Why the United States of America is confused in terms of which one we should be fully invested in is mind-boggling to me. The, the American people are clear on this. The American leadership is befuddling and bewildering. Mm -hmm. Lidar, if, I, if you don't mind, if I could Go just ahead. add to what Arie uh, said. Absolutely. That, you know, we, we lived in a reality pre-October 7th where there was quiet in the region. There was quiet relatively, let's put it that way, on the Gazan border. There was quiet on the northern border. And there was quiet coming from Iran. They chose, the Iranians and their proxies chose to go to an all-out war, starting with the horrendous massacre of October 7th. Uh, they chose to attack the state of Israel and to murder the people of Israel. And that has put us as a country, as a nation, in a position where we really only have two choices. One is to uh, sort of hold off and wait for them to do it again, literally just to sit back and wait for the next, next October 7th or the next attack from Hezbollah or the next rocket attack from Iran, or it is to defeat and defend ourselves. And I think that the people of Israel are quite united from left to, to right across the board that we cannot go back to a reality where our enemies, who have made it so clear that their ultimate goal is our destruction, to just sit back and wait for that to happen. So there really is no choice, be it with international support or without international support. So Ari, you know, I do want to follow up on that and ask you, because, you know, you worked very, very closely with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You, you know, you have intimate knowledge of his, of his thought process. And, you know, from what you, you can tell or from what you know, you know, what are the considerations that are preventing him right now from, you know, taking on the, the Rafah operation, from, you know, it, it sort of get, reaching that ultimate victory, uh, as you both uh, have called for? I mean, is it simply the fact that the United States is, is, is tying his hands, or do you think there's more to it than that? I think that, uh, and I, I, I write about this extensively, how the, the job of prime minister of Israel is the hardest job in the world. And the complexities, even around these types of military situations uh, in Israel, are very different than the complexities that, say, the United States faces in their military uh, operations. When the United States was attacked on 9-11, there was no debate in the United States should the United States respond, uh, and so on and so forth. 
This is unique to Israel's situation, and it always has been. And therefore, the, uh, the juggling between the international considerations, the military considerations, and the domestic political situa situation that the prime minister has to deal with. Keep in mind that uh, the, the, the current government that we have uh, running this war uh, spans uh, pretty far to the right, all the way till you know elements of the left, and that is not an easy balance for a prime minister to uh, to to balance while he's making such critical decisions. So I think that ultimately, uh, we our, our ability to judge the prime minister will be with the final outcome of what happens here. If he leads us to victory, uh, as Arye was saying, when uh, Hamas is no longer. Uh, a ruling entity in Gaza, that will be a victory. When Iran knows that it cannot shoot hundreds of weapons, hundreds of missiles at Israel, that will be a victory. When Hezbollah does not threaten the residents mm -hmm. of the north that have been forced to flee their homes, that would be a victory. Until then, uh, yes, he is dealing with tremendous challenges in a, in a slew of different fronts. Um, but victory uh, should be, and I assume is, his only goal. All right. Well, we are almost out of time, but Arya, I do want to hear uh, some final thoughts from you. Yeah, uh, what Ari articulated, I think, is exactly correct. And for your listeners who are sitting back in Western countries, especially the United States of America, this is not Israel's war. Israel is fighting a war. It's a war of civilizations. Uh, I, I was actually, you know, pondering whether to say this or not. I, I think we insult Islam when we call it the Islamic Republic of Iran. It, it, this is not Islam. I'm not exactly positive what it is, but it seems to be a criminal organization that are based upon some, some insane ideology. And I think it's insulting the fact that the rest of the Middle East is coalesced meaningfully around a moderate Islam that's going to build a Middle East where there will be peace and prosperity for all peoples. And Israel is distinctly and meaningfully part of that Middle East. And it's up to the United States of America and the rest of the West to follow which of the Middle East we are going to invest in, we're going to stand with, when the U.S. does not lead, as we have tended not to since President Biden has become the president, that gap is not filled by Costa Rica or by Sweden. It's filled by China and Russia, and you are seeing exactly what happens when that winds up being the situation. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for this week's Insider. We had sports analogies. We had chess analogies. Thank you so much to our guests, Ari Harrow and Aria Lightstone, for joining us today. And thank you to all our viewers. And don't forget to sign up for ILTV's newsletter and visit our new website at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching. Let's win this war and bring the hostages home.